It was dark. I stared at the ghostly curtain of the mosquito net. The chief's daughter breathed sleep sounds in my ear, and forest noises penetrate mud walls. Nearby, I hear mosquitoes buzzing and leaves shushing. In the distance, hoots and trills and frog songs. My stomach clenches at a grunt nearby. Panther, wild boar, chief snoring in the next bedroom. And even as I tense at every cracking stick outside, I am excited. I am where I want to be. Peace Corps, Africa, Gabon. I teach health education. My French is so-so, but I have two health degrees, and I feel deeply that this is important work. I smile to sleep, fingers crossed that I can hold my bladder until morning because I am not going to the pit toilet in the dark or relieving myself in the can next to the bed. The next morning, I ate manioc. It's sticky and chewy and tastes a bit like fermented socks, but it's better than the <laughs> maggot-infested meat that my hosts are reheating. In an open area outside the chief's house, I set up. Five women with babies arrive. They sit on stools or rocks while older kids play. They yell, Ibamba, Ibamba, basically, white chick, white chick, <laughs> at me. I lunge at them and they run. Are you scared of the ghosts? The women say, pointing at me and laughing. Men gather in the chief's sitting area to drink palm wine and pretend not to listen. My counterpart translates my presentation in Nzebi as I point to my drawings, hoping that my lesson is not lost in some terrible game of telephone. Most women in this village have not finished elementary school, and my interpreter's French is worse than mine. Then I wait. A young man from a nearby village will lead me two miles out of the forest, past elephants and Gabon vipers. He appears wearing jeans and a Led Zeppelin shirt. <laughs> There's something off about him, and I am just a little afraid of him, but I am dependent on him. He likes to joke that if he ditched me, I'd be eaten by leopards. <laughs> he briefly chats with the other men, they make a gesture at me, everybody laughs, and into the forest he goes, and I follow. I fill the silence with thoughts of food. Not the maggoty meat that was almost my breakfast, or the frog soup from the night before, but food I could make. I'd been a vegetarian most of my adult life. But once I started training in Gabon, the dishes I was served mostly included meat. After a month of buttered French bread, I gave up. A small compromise to stay healthy. I became, le I became less picky. Eventually, I just wanted my meat without fur. <laughs> In Mbigu, my town, choices were limited. Occasionally, women would come into the center and they would sell their excess uh, vegetables and fruit. But mostly there were stalls of uh, fresh bread or fish, salted or dried. Uh, we had a market um, that offered little beyond beer, canned peas, and a few staples. I could go out. There were two restaurants. One served the bush meat catch of the day, deer, porcupine, some endangered animal. And the other offered uh, fried plantains with omelets with peas. Locals ate better, but they had something I did not, family. I had no siblings or cousins to work a farm or forage. I had no father, brother, or husband, despite the many, many offers, <laughs> to hunt for me. I complained to the boys that hung out at my house. I was sick of sardine and onion sandwiches. I wanted vegetables and fruit. Michael Jackson II, as he liked to call himself, my favorite, told me as if I was an idiot, just ask. For what? Whatever you want, he shrugged, just ask. Okay, I'm gonna go up to someone and be like, oh, you're so nice, thank you. Um, how are you doing? Can I, you sell me your food? I was annoyed at him, I was annoyed at food, I was annoyed at my own discomfort. Ask me, he says, and he'd been coloring my drawings about boiling water. Do you have any extra food at home? We, oui, papaya, I'll go get some so you can stop crying like a baby. <laughs> 200 CFR for my mom. He stood to leave. Wait, really? We, oui, I'll be right back, not a problem. He laughed at me as he left. Easy as that. 
And he was right. It was as easy as that. The next day, I biked out. I asked women along the route if they had extra fruits or vegetables to sell. And I would come the next day to pick them up on my way home. Halfway to my destination, I had eggplant, various greens, and a bunch of other stuff. Giddy from placing orders, I hurried to say hello to this woman that I saw walking ahead of me. And my excitement faded as I took her in. Exhausted, she barely had the breath to respond. Her clothes were dirty, fur feet bare. She clutched a basket to her chest and had a child strapped to her back. The girl slept, head bouncing, looking too big to be carried. But the mother had no choice. This child was very sick. I'd seen sick, children sick like this at the hospital, and it usually ended in grief. We were both headed to Mianga at the end of the road. Her husband would hunt that night and sell it in Mbigu in the next day. She must raise enough money to afford the three-hour ride down the hill to the American hospital where they had medicine. I'll buy what you catch at a good price, I tell her. The lessons in my backpack felt inadequate. Buying her catch was the only practical way to help, that and carrying her basket to the village. And now that I'm leaving the village in the forest to go back to Mianga, I will see her. I hope that her husband caught something so I can give them money and that her daughter is well enough to make it to the hospital. I repeat my lesson in Mianga. We weigh babies and I get my bike. I see the mother of the sick girl. It'd be great if they got a porcupine. They're small, delicious. I quietly chant all the things I hope it is not. Please don't be monkey, don't be rat, don't be pangolin. They're endangered. How they catch them is terrible, and they're gross. But whatever it is, I will take what she offers and pay what she needs. She approaches, arms full, bloody bits covered by paper and plastic. Well, the rest, the rest of it is golden fur and hooves. She drops the back end of Bambi into my front basket, <laughs> legs in the air, and hands me the shoulder with an attached leg. My stomach twists as I put it in my side basket. The idea of getting fresh meat from a hunter and the reality is different. <laughs> I didn't expect to feel this uncomfortable. It's heavy, I'm unbalanced, and now fear the st steep seven mile bike ride home. I wobble home, picking up the other items I'd purchased, overburdened by my abundance. Mignon, the five-year-old next door, greets me. He's a regular at my house, and I think of him as a sort of nephew. He squeals with excitement when I hand him the deer's shoulder and lists all the things he wants to eat. As he runs it to his mother, Alma. I bring the hindquarters into my kitchen. I stare at it. It stares back. It's like an adolescent Bambi jumped into my kitchen and in some magical realism story is stuck half in my world and half in another. All right, so what does one do with the back end of a deer? Skin it, right? It's simple enough. Cut the, pur uh, cut the fur, peel the skin. I find a small kitchen knife. I grab the leg and pull it and oh my God, no. No way. I, it looks like it kicked. It, like the live front part felt me messing around and tried to shake me off. I rewrap the haunch and throw it in the refrigerator. What am I going to do? Alma. I'll go get Alma. Before Gabon, I say to her in my horrible French, my family brought meat from a store. It didn't have, what's the word for fur? That did not come up in my French class. The hair. It was cut up and in a package, and could you help me figure out how to get what I have into something I could cook? She broke down in laughter. She loved my inability to do anything a competent 10-year-old villager could do. <laughs> like where to collect water. When I tried, I was yelled at for being on the wrong side of people doing dishes. So I hustled upstream only to find myself in the middle of a bunch of naked high school boys washing after soccer. Or the one time I tried to cook taro leaves but choked on the calcium oxalate because I don't know how to prepare it. I didn't know how to wash my clothes by hand or find gas for my stove or the thousand other basic but important things. Now I'm at her door asking for assistance again for food that I didn't even hunt or prep. 
Her teenage son comes at her call. He takes the haunch, and then in Zebi, she relays my ineptitude and tells exactly what she wants him to do. I smile until I can get away, lock my doors, close my shutters, and throw myself on my bed as waves of anger and frustration wash over me. Stop <laughs> fucking laughing at me. I scream into the pillow. I'm out here in the middle of nowhere, not with my family, not with my friends, stuck out here where I can't even see a movie or buy a book because I'm trying to help you and you just keep laughing at me. I don't want to eat that stupid food. I want my food. I don't want my pseudo nephew. I want my actual nieces. I want, I am so tired. I am tired of being sick, tired of being nice, and tired of compromising, and tired of sucking at everything I do. <laughs> Who am I fooling? What people here need, I am perfectly incapable of providing. Medicine, not a health lesson, will heal that girl. Hell, I can't even figure out how to get to the forest by myself or turn the ass end of a deer into something I can eat. <laughs> how am I helping anyone? There's a knock at my door, and I pull myself together. It's the mother of the sick girl. Merci, she says, as I hand her the money I promised. She shakes my hand, holding a little longer than necessary. The teenager returns. He's reduced the animal into what city dwellers recognize as meat, skinless, boneless, easily friable. My band of boys show up. They're here. They want to practice English, cussing mostly play cassettes on the boombox and dance. Madame, watch this, said Michael Jackson as he does a little moonwalk twirls and strikes a pose. The other boys hoot. Give me a hundred francs. I'll go get a Tony Cola, says another, and I do. The night is warm. They'll stay till it's dark, which is about six o'clock on the equator. I appreciate the company. It's gentle and fun. Life here isn't easy, but we have this, these moments of sweetness. I start drawing the next month's health lesson, accident prevention, and explain it to the guys. They gather around me, suggesting things to add, and I feel connected again. It's not perfect here, but it's good. I'm not perfect. I can't save every child, and I may never be able to process a deer, but I'm good enough, and what I do matters. Tabitha Traver, everybody. Tabitha Tobar.